Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us as we talk to you a little bit about hopefully some helpful tips to help you increase success in publishing peer-reviewed research. Um, it's brought to you by the Occupational Therapy Journal of Research, OTJR, and our publishing partners at SAGE. So to get started, we will introduce who's going to be presenting with you today. First, my name is uh, Tim Wolf. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of OTJR, and also the Associate Dean for Research and Professor and Chair of Occupational Therapy at University of Missouri. And I will let my co-hosts introduce themselves. Uh, so hi, I'm Melissa. I am the assistant editor with OTJR, and I'm also an occupational therapist and PhD candidate at Western University in London, Canada. Hello, I'm Jessica Lepowski. I'm a publishing editor at SAGE, so I'm, I'm grateful to be here as the publishing partner for OTJR. My main role with SAGE is to work with journal editors and societies to help with key strategies and focus on building up the journal and helping with growth. All right. It's our pleasure to be with you all today. So here's just a quick overview of what we plan to discuss over the next 45 minutes to an hour with you all and things that we thought would be helpful for authors to know a little bit more about. Won't read everything on the slide, figured you all will be able to follow along with us, but just gonna start off here with talking a little bit about the journal itself. So OTJR, the Occupational Therapy Journal of Research, uh, you may or may not notice for those of you who have been following the journal for some time, that the journal originally started as the Occupational Therapy Journal of Research, but then for the last 20 years, we actually were known as OTJR, Occupation Participation and Health. Um, we recently made a decision to change that back. So starting in January of 2023, we'll once again be known as OTJR, the Occupational Therapy Journal of Research. So OTJR is published quarterly by the American Occupational Therapy Foundation. Uh, we invite pretty much any and all submissions that have to do with occupational therapy and occupational science, uh, nationally or internationally, mostly uh, peer review articles and re review articles that look at participation or different factors that could influence health and well-being as well. Again, all of the submissions, though, have to have some focus or content that's going, meant to advance the profession of occupational therapy in some way. Um, Sorry, there we go. <laughs> My mouse decided to stick at a very inconvenient time. Uh, some general topics of interest that we're interested in, and in no way is this a comprehensive list. Again, looking at the relationship of occupation, health, well-being, and quality of life. We are interested in manuscripts as well that look at body structure, body function, and what that influence could be on occupation performance as well as participation. We say psychometric properties of measures or methodologies to advance our understanding of performance, occupation, participation, so instrument development studies. I would say that's not really even limited to psychometric evaluation, it'd be clinometric evaluation, depending on the instruments that you're looking at as well. Uh, looking at the outcomes or effects of intervention, again, anything that would be an intervention that would be in the sphere of influence of occupational therapy would be of interest to us. Um, and again, that follows along with the next one that says that we're interested in effectiveness and efficacy of occupation-based interventions. Looking at the role of the environment on occupational performance as well. Um, in terms of methodology, we specifically list that we are interested and we will consider for publication qualitative mixed methods research, quantitative research. Uh, specifically, we put this one here for occupational science. And when we have a section specifically devoted to occupational science that I believe we mentioned here in a little bit as well. And again, this is not a comprehensive list. So if whatever research you're working on is in the sphere of influence of occupational therapy, we're happy to consider it and you're welcome to reach out anytime to discuss it with me or anyone on the publishing team or, edit or editorial team to see if, uh, if you think that anything would be a fit for OTJR. So we, as the Journal of the American Occupational Therapy Foundation, part of our charge is to make sure that we're in line with what AOTF's priorities are and what their strategic plan is and what their goals are for helping to advance research in the profession. This is the updated list of research priorities. So if even if you were familiar with the AOTF research priorities, this one's brand new as of this past month. Uh, some overlap, uh, of course, with some of the research priorities in the past, but this is the most updated list. And so for us as an editorial team, this is what we pay particular interest to when we're trying to say, making sure that we're publishing, you know, uh, manuscripts that are in 
relative, relative uh, uh, necessary and uh, relevant for the profession of occupational therapy. Again, not a comprehensive list though. So even if you don't see your manuscript fitting in with this, we'll still consider it for publication. This also what we look at sometimes when we are considering special issues for the journal. So if you see something here within a research priority that you believe could be a special issue, we're happy to have that discussion with you as well. These are the types of articles we consider. So first, uh, original research. These are full-length research articles. Again, for those of you who have been familiar or following the journal, you might notice that there's a few changes on this slide as well. We increased the word count recently as we notice that's becoming more of a challenge for our authors to fit within the word count. And so now with original research, we've increased that word count to 5,500 words plus tables. Uh, the different types of research here, empirical, translational, basic research studies, quantitative, qualitative, mixed methods, any and all of it uh, will be interest to us and will fit in here. We have the specific occupational science research section. So occupational science uh, work that fits in as well, happy to consider that, and then any systematic and scoping reviews. We also consider book reviews, uh, a thousand word limit on those. Uh, forum proceedings, 5,500 words, but that's something that you will want to check in with me first uh, to make sure that there's uh, following the content and kind of what the interest would be in a peer review publication for reporting those those four proceedings. So a specific format with that and what content that would be really tied to the profession, to the foundation that we would want you to follow for it to be considered for publication. And we put this on here and we have it listed as new. I think we can still call it new for at least the time being. Uh, it's been within the last year that we uh, decided to start publishing invited reviews and commentaries. These are uh, invite only from the editor-in-chief. I'm always happy to consider uh, if you have a proposal, please send it to me at, to see if there would be of interest to publish within the journal. Again, 5,500 words on this, but it has to be something that talks about state of the science or research needs in an area of practice or something else that's important to the scientific community within occupational therapy as well. So um, not it, we want it to be tied, obviously, to practice, but it has to be something to help advance science as well. So having the tie between the two would be wonderful. What we don't publish, yeah. uh, so I get to end my section on a, a low note here. Sorry about this. <laughs> uh, protocol only manuscripts. Uh, we do obviously see some value in being able to publish a protocol for a clinical trial or some other intervention study. However, that is not something at this time that we consider for publication within the journal. Education focused research. So anything that's reporting on outcomes of an edu OT education based study. So if you're looking at a new teaching methodology in the classroom. If there's no tie, direct tie to practice and advancing practice, and it's education focused only, we don't consider it for publication. We also don't publish occupational health and safety manuscripts um, without being some tie to occupational therapy profession. And that one can be a little bit more of a gray area. And so again, if you have a doubt about whether or not it's a fit, you're welcome to reach out and we're happy to discuss that with you ahead of time before you go through a submission process. Uh, for related to open access, we are not an open access journal, but we do offer an open access option via the Sage Choice program. And if you want more information on that, this link at the bottom will get you there, or you're welcome to just Google Sage Choice program, and I believe this will be the first thing that comes up. And so if you want to see if your manuscript is eligible and what the pricing would be for that, you're welcome to click on this link. And again, if you have questions, please feel free to email us and we can direct you to the right place. Great. Thank you, Tim. Well, we have a few tips here that we'd love to go through to help you enhance the success of getting your manuscript accepted. So first of all, you'll want to ask yourself a few key questions. Who is going to be interested in the research that you're working on. Millions of journal articles are published a year and OTJR receives numerous submissions. So what is going to set yourself apart? How does your research build on what we already know? How significant or novel is your message? Is it filling a gap in the research? Is it extending a theory? Is it correcting research that's already been published? 
what are you wanting or needing to publish with your work and what will it contribute to the field? So with thousands of journals out there, there's a few key factors that you'll want to consider when you are looking at a journal to submit. So including OTJR, you'll want to think about the reputation of the journal. Do your peers and colleagues read that journal? Are you familiar with it? Is it something that is backed by a foundation or a society like OTJR? But as we drill down, there's a few other key considerations. You'll want to be looking at what type of paper are you writing? Is it original research? Is it a case report, a systematic review? Journals will only accept article types just as Tim had covered. Take a look at the aims and scope. Tim also just covered the main types of manuscripts that OTGR does and does not publish. And so that might be one of the key reasons for rejection is that your article may not be within scope. You can take a look at things like acceptance rate. Some journals have a 5% acceptance rate, others have uh, a higher acceptance rate, and that really varies on a variety of different things, including the number of submissions received each year, as well as maybe something was recently published. Maybe it doesn't fit within the aims and scope. Uh, thinking about the type of peer review. Is it single anonymous, double anonymous, or open or transparent peer review? Maybe that will influence where you want to submit thinking about the type of indices that the journal is indexed in. So one of the, the things that can tie back into reputation is, is the journal indexed in Medline or PubMed Central? Is the, if it's an open access journal, is it indexed in the directory of open access journals or the DOAJ? So looking for different indices that it might be tied to. If it's an education, it might be an ERIC. Uh, last but not least, you might have uh, funder requirements or institutional requirements to where you submit. So thinking about, are you required to submit open access? And journals like OTJR have that what we call hybrid option or the Sage Choice option. So you might be coming from an institution that is eligible for a discount or a waiver, like with the CRKN out of Canada. If you're an author from that institution, you will receive a waiver to publish open access in OTJR. But not only that, funders might have certain requirements related to uh, impact factor or uh, an index. So take a close look at the different requirements. But the most important thing is to focus on the readership. Who is reading the journal? You want to make sure if, if no one is reading your article, if no one's reading your research, what is the point? So think about the readership of the journal and who it's reaching. And you know, that will be a very um, important factor. So you might want to submit in the highest impact factor journal ever, but that doesn't always mean that your research will therefore be top cited. So focus on the research and the readership and the rest will come. As you prepare for submission, the number one thing that we can recommend is following the manuscript guidelines. So follow those author guidelines as closely as you can and make every effort to improve the quality of your manuscript. Try to be as objective as possible. It can be tough receiving constructive feedback, but try to follow those guidelines as closely as possible. You'll want to make sure to include um, the funny funding statements, conflict of interest declarations, and any ethical statements. The Equator Network is a great tool if you're not quite sure what uh, research ethics or procedures you should be following. So we recommend taking a look at websites and tools like that to make sure that you're following all the proper procedures, including gathering any patient consent, what have you. This is just a very brief overview of what an article structure might look like. Of course, this will vary per manuscript type uh, and can vary by journal. Uh, so you'll have the introduction, what is the purpose of the study covering your hypothesis? What did you actually research? And what is the question that you're addressing? You might even go into the literature review depending on the requirements of that journal. Then you'll be focusing on materials and methods. 
What did you actually do? How did you conduct that research? What was your technique? How many participants or patients were part of that study? How did you select them? And you'll want to include any relevant uh, materials or methods used, including ethical approval that you needed to require. If ethical approval was waived uh, from your institutional review board, it's good to state that as well. You will need to state that. Uh, then you'll be covering the results. What did you actually get after you conducted this research? Present your data and talk through any complications that may have come out from this research. Within the discussions, what do those, that's where you'll go through what the results actually mean. And how does this tie into previous studies in relation to what you conducted? How is that data set overarching and, and related to science, the field as a whole? And then how does this answer your hypothesis that you addressed in the introduction? Last but not least, you'll be focusing on the conclusions. What are the implications of your research? What future studies do you recommend? Something will always come next in that project process, and you might want to include any limitations or considerations as people are reading through your research. You'll also want to make sure as you're writing and drafting your manuscript that you're thinking about discoverability and search engine op optimization. So if again, if no one is finding your article and no one's reading it, no one's citing it, and it's not furthering science. So you'll want to focus on other things like having a well-written title, having a well-written abstract and thinking about what would your reader search for when trying to find your research. So you can find a way to repeat those in a natural way, those keywords and key phrases that you might be searching for throughout your manuscript. And in particular, that title and abstract will really help with discoverability. So keep those, keep those end readers in mind as you're working on your manuscript. <clears throat> second here. Thank you, Jessica. I'm going to switch this over here to Melissa, if I could. Yeah. One second. Absolutely. There so we, we will be um, okay. So we'll be just chatting here about the peer review process and basically what happens after you hit submit. So we've talked a lot about uh, what what scope are you uh, looking at and what kind of research do we accept and um, how to be uh, promoting success before you hit submit. But it's also really helpful uh, to understand what is that process on the back end, what some pitfalls might be, and that really helps you to navigate things um, as well. All right, so the first thing that we're going to be looking at here is the submission checklist. So you'll find this is often titled as the author's guidelines, uh, and they would be available for any journal that you're going to submit to, uh, and they are on the OTJR website, as well as if you're in Scholar One preparing your submission there, you'd be able to download it from that site as well, okay? So uh, do consider the submission checklist, these author's guidelines, these are your best friend to having a smooth process throughout the peer review um, uh, process that you're going to be entering into. So um, the first thing we need to do is to make sure that you read that and understand, given the type of your research, what those uh, submission requirements are and to make sure that you adhere to them 100%. Um, so these are things like looking at the word limit. So as Tim mentioned, we have recently increased the word limit, um, generally speaking from 5,000 up to 5,500 words to give some extra space to be able to let you, you know, most clearly communicate your research findings. And um, when we look at whether references are included or not, there is some variability based on the type of research. So for original research articles that have to adhere to consort reporting guidelines, as well as systematic or scoping reviews, um, it's actually 5,500 words um, from introduction to the end of conclusions, and that does not include the reference list. That gives you a bit more room in those uh, articles because of the reporting standards and content that goes along. All other submissions are 5,500 words from uh, including the reference list. Okay, so double check that so that you're adhering to that. 
um, and looking at just the reference um, reference style and guidance. So we do use APA, whatever the most recent version is. So currently that's seven and uh, making sure that you're following through with the cover letter um, and uh, the figures and tables again to that APA standard there. Uh, we do have a new piece that we are launching in January of 2023, and this is a plain language summary. So there will be a plain language title, as well as a brief summary of the research um, using non-technical language that's going to be widely accessible to a broad audience of those knowledge users. So thinking from um, potential clients or family members, clinicians, policymakers, and media. And so really bringing, bringing them in to the fold as well to be able to get your research out better. Um, when you do submit, just looking to make sure that there's no identifying information in that manuscript, and that's going to really help us with that anonymous peer review. Um, if you're needing some extra help around English language editing, know that that's available through SAGE as well. And just if you do have any copyrighted material, consider that. Um, there is always the option of having some supplemental data, um, and so this is things that are uh, not essential in understanding the content and flow of your manuscript, but might be interesting extra information for readers that might need it. So, for example, um, perhaps an interview guide that you used or um, data on a search strategy for a systematic review. So this is information that would be posted to the website only but is not typeset and counted within the article guidelines there. So there's information on that on the website as well. Okay, so we'll just chat through the editorial process. So um, this is the step that you see when you're on Scholar 1, you're going to hit submit, and then your next piece is that you are going to celebrate with your coworkers and maybe let them know that that manuscript is in and the clock is started on the peer review process. And that is where uh, your colleagues over at OTJR, uh, that's where we come into play. So on our end, we have a team of editorial fellows um, who will be reviewing your manuscript in terms of the scope to make sure it's a type of uh, research that we do publish uh, here at OTJR. It fits the scope of our content as well. We do go through and verify that the author's guidelines uh, have all been met so that it is eligible for peer review. So um, at this stage, you might get what's called an unsubmit. That is not a reject, but an unsubmit might, might be that if we're seeing that there is a concern around um, author's guidelines, perhaps there's some identifying information um, in the manuscript. We will send it back to you as an unsubmit, which is basically we returned it to draft so you can make that quick edit and resubmit. Um, at this stage, um, if it is out of scope, there might also be a, a notice to you on that, if that is uh, what we would call an immediate reject, just for out of scope, okay? Um, and this is done through the editor-in-chief as well. So we'll send it to the editor-in-chief, and he is going to determine which associate editor is best suited to be handling your submission and to be looking at who the peer reviewers will be. And our associate editors will read through your submission to get an overview of the content and to identify and invite those reviewers so that they can take on this review process. Typically, the peer review process itself, once we get the reviewers there, is about three weeks. Um, and then they are able to submit their summary to our associate editor who again reads through everything, synthesizes and comes to a recommendation. And in consultation with our editor in chief, we'll be having a decision come soon. So in terms of the timeline from when you submit through to getting that initial decision, um, we do keep track of those um, metrics uh, online and usually in our January editorial. So if you are curious to know, we are quite transparent. Um, currently we are in the range of 38 to 40 days, typically, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, but on average, that's about where we are at OTJR. So pretty responsive time. And in here, this is where you'll be getting an email from the editor-in-chief that's going to advise whether your article has been accepted, whether there's a revise and resubmit a rejection, or a new decision that we will be uh, launching shortly, which is a reject and resubmit as well. So here, you may begin again. So if you are in that process where you're in revisions, um, then this will occur over again. And uh, you might expect a couple of iterations in there. 
before and accept. So uh, at OTGR, we have a review, a structured review template that we use. Um, and this has gone through several iterations. And in January 2023, we are launching a new streamlined template that is embedded in the Scholar One website. So we have just popped up a couple of examples to give you a bit of a flavor as to what to expect. Um, and that this will make it more efficient for reviewers, but also more consistent um, so that we um, can be confident confident with our authors that you're getting good quality and comprehensive feedback on your work. Um, so these items are prompts that the reviewers will be asked to consider, and they will be asked to identify whether by section there's any reviews or revisions, sorry, that may be required, and that there are several prompts, so say four to six prompts kind of per section of items that they're considering when they structure that feedback to the authors and give that back in. And back to you, Tim. Thank you, Melissa. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the section research done well, the art of a good manuscript, and just some things to consider as you're pulling the manuscript together before you submit it to OTJR. Uh, so first impressions, the things that, you know, at first glance, what our reviewers will look at, what our, you know, ultimately if it's published, what the readers will look at is writing style, right? Some things to consider in there. First of all, a match with the writing style and then also the methodology and content for what you are reporting on and just the two go together. Um, I think of this, you know, kind of all four of these is together are working together in a in general, it's just saying that the language is clear, the language is consistent, and that it's able to be read easily. Uh, it has some flow and cohesiveness to it so that the, the, the different sections of the manuscript kind of go together as you're reading through. Um, and then the, the main, or I should say the main one, sorry, still <laughs> bubbling through this a little bit. Uh, is that there's bias-free and inclusive language. And it's important that it's something that our reviewers are, are supposed to look for as well. It's something that the editorial team will look for as well. And certainly feedback that we'll send back to uh, the authors on revision if it's something that we notice is missing or within the manuscript as well. So some other things just overall at the manuscript they're looking for is, first of all, if their reporting guidelines were required for the type of submission that you send in. So for example, if you're reporting on a clinical trial, we will make sure that the editorial team as well as the reviewers are looking that you follow the consort guidelines, right? So making sure you're using that checklist as you're pulling uh, your manuscript together and filling that out as you go, make sure you hit on all those key points. Because that would be something, again, like Melissa said, that we might unsubmit and send back when we catch it, say, look, this section of the reporting guidelines is missing. Uh, that there's a clear contribution of the field. And I think that this is, this is really important to put in there, because I think as we write, we're so comfortable with our area of research. And for us, most of the time, like, we fully comprehend, like, the bigger picture, how this fits into advancing the science within occupational therapy. However, that doesn't always come through in what we write or how we write. So we want to make sure that 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 contribution to the field is clear. How is this advancing the science within this area? You know, what was the previous research that led to this point? What's going to come next uh, in terms of how we're going to see this progress along? The appropriateness of the literature review and the references. So making sure, like, especially in the introduction, that you well justify the study, right? And that you review the literature that was relevant, appropriate, and comprehensive enough to show that you, there, this really is a clear understanding of kind of where we were headed into your study, okay? Um, and making sure that we're referencing not only the work within OT, but if this is a multidisciplinary field, which OT we tend to be, that we're looking outside of, you know, OT to find who else is working in this space and kind of what we know from these other fields that's contributing to this as well. And then the final one with this is just making sure you have a descriptive figure legend. So figures are a wonderful tool to help us better convey uh, some information in a concise way, right, within the manuscript. So not duplicative of what we have in, in the text, but as an, another way to kind of highlight something but making sure that we have a good legend so people can follow that figure and understand what you're trying to show uh, with that. Uh, 
terms of ethics, I know uh, Jessica had mentioned this before, making sure we have proper ethics and approval, uh, approval is not only really important, uh, just in terms of just uh, uh, good quality research and making sure that we have IRB approval and that we're making sure we're protecting the human subjects. It's also required. And so I would say one of the key things, and Melissa can correct me if I'm wrong, that we unsubmit for is where it's not clear if there's been ethics approval for a study. And even if it is not required, if you're able to get a waiver of informed consent just by the nature of the data that you're using, if it, you know, if your IRB says, look, there's no risk to human subjects, we still want to see a statement that says that that there, this was submitted to an IRB. They did say that it was we we got a waiver of uh, from the IRB who says this was an exempt study. Okay. If it if you do have IRB approval and you do have to get informed consent from study participants, making sure that you're following the uh, best practices in terms of obtaining informed consent, making sure that's stated in the manuscript as well, right? That all participants were provided written informed consent or implied consent or whatever it might be um, to participate in the study. Uh, making sure that when you submit the manuscript to us that you do everything you can to make it anonymous. So we'll ask you for an anonymous copy. We'll ask you for another one that's not. And so when we send out for peer review, we want to make sure that we try to get as unbiased blind review as possible, right? So any names of institutions, if you have pictures, figures, student names, you know, previous work or things like that, that you think could let the author know uh, who conducted the study or where it was conducted, we want to make sure that we're uh, doing our due diligence to try to um, to blind that before we send it in, especially in a field of occupational therapy. I mean, it's not, as most of you know, who publish within this area, not a huge field. So it, it doesn't take much for something to not be anonymous. And then just no clear signs of data or image manipulation. Make sure that we're following best practices again with conducting research and that we're not manipulating data in a way to you know support our hypothesis, but leading to false conclusions. Things we look for in methods and analysis, looking for flaws in study design. And I, I know it's a really harsh term. We always talk about flaws and fatal flaws, but just looking to make sure that the study design, and the methodology match with what the aims were and the objectives of the study, right? And then also how that kind of flows into the discussion and interpretation of the study as well. So, you know, if you're doing an early, early phase, you know, uh, maybe even an observational study, but then in a discussion talking about evidence for the profession and supporting her role, right? It may not be necessarily be a match. But then also, again, in terms of flaws, just say, oh, I wanted to measure X outcome, but then you didn't have an X outcome measure, right? Something like along those lines are key things that we look for and our reviewers look for. Reproducibility is, uh, is incredibly important, especially in any type of intervention study that we review. This is becoming increasingly important. There's much more federal regulation that's trying to focus on this as well. It's part of the reason why we have to register clinical trials. But when you're reporting in a manuscript, and again, it's, it, I sorry, I keep reverting to clinical trials because that's the work I do, but this applies, of course, to any methodology, um, that you are reporting methodology in a way that that study could be reproduced in the future, right? making sure that there's enough detail there that another author could follow what you did and potentially reproduce it down the road. The relevance of statistical techniques, again, we're looking for match. And I think that that's kind of a key message across any of these is, you know, if you said that you were looking at your priority hypotheses and you're saying you want to be able to identify an effect or if you want to be able to prove a relationship, we need to make sure that the statistical analysis that you picked, or statistical techniques that you picked, is something that can actually achieve that, right? Um, and then finally, looking at the appropriateness of all the materials and methods, we're, it's, it's a similar thing. And part of this, obviously, is a qualitative judgment, but saying whether or not the methods were appropriate for the type of study that you were trying to do. And then with results, discussion, and conclusions, are the results presented in a way that best emphasizes the findings? Again, Clarity uh, and consistency with the rest of the methodology and manuscript is what we're looking for with this. Uh, also, when you're saying, when you write like the analysis for how, for what you're trying to prove or what you're trying to show, what you're trying to identify, 
making sure that the results follow through on what your analysis plan is, right? And that you say, look, this is how we're going to do this. This is the techniques we're going to use. And then the results that follow is the report of exactly that. Um, are all the sections free of unsupported generalizations or assumptions? Again, we have some, I always like academic liberty with discussion to kind of talk about what our data mean or what the study means in a general context within the profession, uh, but making sure that we're keeping that in line with what we can actually draw from those data, right? So I kind of gave an example before of, you know, early phase work, we're looking at proof of concept, but then talking about it as being evidence to support an area of practice. At that point, it's not really evidence to support practice, right? It's more evidence of proof of concept. We haven't established the effect. We haven't evaluated that effect yet. And so making sure that we're just keeping those in check to in line with what our study is, and then talking about what comes next in order to lead to that eventual outcome, hopefully. Uh, are the conclusions appropriate for the study? I believe this, again, goes with what we were just talking about with the generalizations and assumptions. And are there appropriate limitations and directions for future research? Um, there's no study that does not have limitations, right? And as I always tell people I work with, like we as investigators should be our own worst critic. And when we're, at, we're looking at our research, we know what those limitations are and we certainly just need to acknowledge them. And that's definitely feedback we get through peer review too. Is some of the reviewers identify, look, this is a potential limitation that just needs to be reported. So people will understand when they read this, that this is something that was probably relevant to this area of research that needs to be considered in the future, right? That's usually why we talk about limitations and directions for future research together. As we identify a limitation, say this is something that's critical that we need to consider as we continue to advance this area of science. Some additional resources for you at Sage Campus. And again, here's a website for that, but you can also Google Sage Campus. Uh, some tools, skills, things that might help you as you're uh, pulling together a manuscript or learning about different sections of manuscripts and any tips that you want. Uh, Sage has done a wonderful job of pulling this together, and I encourage you to check it out if you have some time. All right, with that, I believe I am passing it back to Melissa, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There we go. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, well, we're just chatting a little bit about um, once we've got those reviews back and we've got perhaps some revisions to work on, how are we gonna effectively respond to these? And here we go. And so just to handle the elephant in the room first and start off with the negative topic, how are we handling a rejection potentially? So um, as Jessica mentioned, the acceptance rates at various journals um, vary uh, quite substantially and, and for a number of reasons that are all good reasons in terms of the number of submissions and scope and all that good stuff as well. So um, at uh, OTGR, our acceptance ratio is again, typically published in that January editorial. And it varies somewhere between 18 to 25 to 30% or so, uh, depending on the year. And a good chunk of that is some of those out of scope um, or article types that we don't accept, right? So in terms of um, uh, trying to be strategic and reduce the number of rejections, just verifying that, uh, that scope right off the bat, right? And that, as Tim mentioned, in terms of all of the art of the good manuscript, um, you know, are you following those reporting standards? Do you know that everything's matching, right? Uh, in terms of the question to the methods to the results and implications and tying those in well. But uh, anyhow, we've all been in the position where we have a manuscript rejected and uh, we're just needing to reflect there in terms of criticisms are there to uh, help to enhance your paper. Um, and to take some time with it, maybe have a tea and uh, to just have that um, understand the comments and read those letters carefully and to think about why perhaps that manuscript was rejected. So <clears throat> was it a uh, scope concern? Was it in terms of needing to enhance clarity around your aims and methods and so forth? Um, and might it be eligible for a resubmit even though it was rejected? So journals do vary in terms of if it was rejected, are you eligible to resubmit to the same journal or not. Uh, at OTGR, we are implementing a new decision that is uh, will be termed a re reject and resubmit. And so this might be something that if there was 
um, more uh, concerns around like the conceptual framing or the clarity of the research question and continuity that uh, perhaps the extent of revisions required and the refocusing in terms of um, those aims might render it into essentially a new manuscript that this is when we might use the reject and resubmit as an option. Um, it doesn't, uh, a reject decision does not always mean that the, the research is of, um, you know, poor quality or it's not going to be beneficial in the field um, a, or could make some great contribution. That's not true. It, it definitely could. It might just be, is this the right home? And is it as clear and, uh, and well reported as it could be to help you have that um, successful accept, okay? Um, so definitely you might be reworking that paper to address those reviewer concerns. It may be with the same journal, it may be with the new journal. All right, it's all about finding that fit that's going to best allow you to communicate your research findings. When we have revisions, um, again, go through, you'll have uh, comments from the editor and associate editor. Um, who are on our editorial board, and then each reviewer will be providing their own set of comments following our streamline review. So you'll get comments on the abstract, the introduction, the methods, and the results to help you really sort through where folks are at. Um, when you are um, getting those revisions, there's typically a, a time frame associated, um, you know, somewhere between two and four weeks typically. And uh, you can look at those uh, timelines and consider that when you're responding to the reviews, just making sure that you're demonstrating clarity that you have uh, receive those comments and how you've addressed it. So often um, re uh, authors are submitting um, perhaps a table or so to say review or comment in our response. And um, when you are making edits in the manuscript or in the tables or figures or so forth, um, just highlighting in there as well. So that when the reviewer is going back to check um, in terms of the, the clarity and to make sure those comments are addressed, that it's really easy for them to skim through it. Um, that's gonna help you get through this peer review process more quickly as well. So it takes a, a little bit of time, but the clarity is really, really helpful on the editorial side to help you be successful. If the changes aren't clear to our editorial fellows that each of the comments has been addressed, that will be a thing uh, that would um, have us have an unsubmit at this stage to send, it, to send it back to you, to return it to draft so that we do clearly see that, okay? Um, there are times when you might not be able to meet all of the criticisms of the paper or the feedback. So if perhaps a reviewer's suggestion is not feasible or perhaps incorrect or something, um, you can explain why politely and, uh, and, and, and challenge that assumption as well, okay? Uh, and just know that this process might take a few iterations in there and that when you do resubmit, uh, the author's guidelines still apply. So the, we, absolutely understand the um, challenge in terms of perhaps integrating more detail or more clarity, but within the word limit, right? So, but the word limits still do apply on the resubmit. And I believe Jessica, you are going to be taking on next here. Yeah. Thank you. So if after all of this time you have gone through numerous revisions and your article has finally been accepted. A big congratulations. <laughs> yeah. So after you celebrate, what's next? So once you have signed all the contributor forms, uh, once you have signed all of the contributor forms and it has been exported to production, you We'll start by going out uh, to our copy editing team and our typesetting team to get that article ready to keep moving forward. Once our team has completed that process, it will then come back to you, the author, for a review to check your proofs one last time. The OTJR editorial team will also be doing a proof of that. Those corrections will be collated and then there will be a revised PDF created. Once that is complete, it will then go to online first or EPUB ahead of print publication. And so this will be before the article is assigned to an actual issue. This is 
a fantastic stage. It can already be shared, disseminated uh, with your network and with your colleagues and cited as well, uh, even though it may not be placed in an issue. Then the, the editorial team will eventually assign that article to an issue. Sometimes it might be tied to a special theme or a collection, and so therefore it might take some time before it gets assigned to that print publication. And then you as the author will receive that a copy of that final article uh, for you and your co-authors. Once it is online, the process absolutely does not end with publication. So we can continue that celebration by continuing to share it with your network, your colleagues, your students to help drive that readership. You want to make people are accessing the research. So not only to have downloads and citations, so you can share that on your social media, including Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. You can also maybe suggest it to be used in course material for some of your students or your colleague students. With this plain language summary that's being implemented, it might be good to expand upon that and turn that into a blog post. Here at SAGE, we have our SAGE Perspectives blog, and you can write a blog post to help with additional visibility and get more eyeballs on your research. Maybe your institution or organization or, or hospital could send out a press release. We can help you with, with that as well to make sure there's broader news pickup. And there's a whole variety of tips on, on ways that you can disseminate it. But not only is the OTJR team promoting your research, SAGE is promoting it, but you are going to be your best advocate. So definitely read some of our SAGE guides on how you can promote that research further. Yeah, and you can also connect with us online. So OTGR, we actually do have a social media fellow um, that uh, sole uh, role uh, with us is to coordinate with uh, SAGE as well. So you do have the option when you submit a manuscript to OTGR, when you're in the Scholar One portal, if you have a Twitter handle, um, you may enter that and you may also compose a couple of suggested tweets. Um, and uh, that will help our team. So when we do receive that, um, those are connected with our social media um, fellow uh, who does all of the promotion for our journal. You can connect with us on Twitter at OTJR Journal or on Instagram at OT Research Foundation. And you can see some of the example tweets here that we've uh, used to promote some of the articles there. So you can follow along um, to learn. It's a great way actually just to stay current in terms of seeing what is published. So uh, every new manuscript that we accept and is online um, does have a tweet, uh, at least one that would go out with that. And, and then we have different topics throughout the week in terms of, um, you know, polls and that sort of thing um, that you can follow along just to keep, keep in contact. And we do coordinate as well with AOTF and any of their um, uh, ongoing uh, promotions, you know, when we get grants and scholarship opportunities as well, we try to help each other out. Um, so to help everybody stay abreast of those changes. So with that, uh, I just want to close by saying that uh, the three of us are always open to have a conversation about anything you're interested in publishing and research with OTJR the journal. Um, again, I think we've, you know, throughout this presentation, I think we've alluded to that several times and said, hey, feel free to contact us, feel free to look us up, and here's contact information for all of us as well. If you have any questions, uh, three of us talk pretty consistently too. So if you don't have to worry about who to contact for what, just contact one of us and we'll get you to the right place. But we're always happy to talk about this, always happy to talk about the journal, always happy to talk about research as well. So please feel free to reach out anytime if you have questions about this. And with that, we'll sign off here. Uh, we appreciate your time, appreciate you watching this and looking forward to seeing your submissions come into OTJR in the future. Thank you all.